Hey everybody, it's Rajesh here. And Tane here. Welcome to our podcast, Baskets of Knowledge, Chess with a Difference. In our podcast, we invite guests from around the country and around the world to talk about how they got to where they are at the moment. It's about a journey, it's about an experience, it's about their life. Kira to everybody. Welcome to um, podcast episode 49, I think, because I'm going to go with that today. Um, and welcome back, Tana. We've missed you with the last few podcasts. How have you been? Yeah, I've been good, thanks. I've missed being on the podcast too. Um, it's felt a bit weird having to edit it without actually being on it, but it's kind of nice to not hear my voice all the time as well. So yeah, positives and negatives. Yeah, um, it's always it's always difficult when you do a podcast like because we've done this together for a while. So um, but welcome back. And um, like I said to our listeners, the last few times you've been away doing some awesome stuff with the Rugby League, uh, which is pretty cool, I think, for you, given that you just started it recently or got cut back into recently. And over the last few weeks, or maybe last week, what have you put into your basketball knowledge? What learnings? I think something that I'm learning now that we've been on break, um, and especially uh, towards the end of my league season, I got injured, so had a knee injury that I've been overcoming. Um, and now the last couple of days, I've got the flu. Um, which have both been barriers to me trying to do the half marathon next weekend. Um, but I think it's about how we look at those barriers and just being able to, you know, despite despite me not being able to play the final for our league and despite, you know, not being able to do as much training as I want to, I still have a lot of positives that I can take away from it, from it. So, you know, although those barriers have come, I'm still very grateful that I was, you know, able to get back into rugby league and, and still, fingers crossed, going to be able to do the half marathon next week. So a lot of there are barriers. It's just about how we actually perceive it and what we can do to get past those barriers. Yeah, and I guess also it also shows you that you can have all these amazing plans and life just goes, nah. You know? Yeah, Here we go. Mm-hmm. You have this plan. I was like, okay, nope. Okay, cool. And um, But it's awesome to see you back and have fingers crossed that you can get on to, get on to run a half marathon by choice next mm-hmm. next week keyword is by choice i mean hey who does that um awesome and that, i guess that segues into what into my uh my learnings from the last week as well um that uh like you you know we have all these crazy cool plans to do things and we have i mean i, I work with my diary i work with the diary is how i live my life at the moment and um sometimes you can have your whole life planned in a diary and nah it's not going to happen it's just not going to happen and you've got to be able to leverage and you've, you've got to be able to be adaptable and flow and sometimes i just get so caught up with the, with what's happened that i forget that hey if i just flow it's gonna be okay and i guess one of the was one of the mantras i now live by is um if this doesn't happen is anybody going to get adversely affected if not then it's okay i can just take it by my stride and if i'm late i'm late if i make a mistake i make a mistake you know um as long as i'm not a heart surgeon so that's okay i'm allowed to make a mistake <laughs> all right cool so um i know we have missed how our chats but um we're not here to talk to each other. We're here to bring in our guest. And as always, um, to our listeners out there, thank you for following, for following us and for the feedback you've given us. And we always try to bring people from, from around the country and across the world that are pretty amazing. And I think everybody's amazing because everyone's got a story to tell. And that's no different to our amazing guest today. Welcome to our podcast, Bo. Hey, thank you for having me. No, it's our pleasure to have you on here. Um, but before we start our podcast, you just want to tell our listeners a bit about where you are at the moment in your stage of of bow life, I guess, and then we'll get into the rest. Yeah. Um, well, right now I'm in my uh, final year of undergrad, final semester as well. Um, I've been studying psychology and gender studies as majors and criminology as a minor. Um, and I'm a second year subwarden at uh, Caroline Freeman College as well. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm at. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And um, let's start from, I guess, the beginning. So today, this is where we are at the moment. If we could reverse back and go back to Bo as a year 13, where was Bo as a year 13? They weren't a year 13. I'm um, actually a dropout of high school. Um, I dropped out before even year 12. So uh, I got my level one NCA and then I was out of there, I'll be honest. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know a little about this, the story of yours, but do you want to share with our listeners about what happened? You know, why why did you make that choice or was it a choice that was forced upon you at that point in time? I mean, yeah, there was a, there was a bit of both there, wasn't there? Um, throughout high school... 
well, throughout all of school, I, I was pretty badly bullied. Um, and I ended up shifting around high schools a fair bit, trying to find a community that kind of fit for me um, and, you know, a safe kind of environment. Um, and unfortunately, in, in the town that I grew up in, um, as uh, a queer person, I am um, I identify as uh, bi and um, transgender, uh, transmasculine specifically. Um, it wasn't a very... Um, understanding and accepting kind of uh place to grow up in um so I, I was bullied quite a lot and I um I got quite anxious at school I would uh show up to school and within the hour uh, I would probably be in the nurse's office speaking to go home uh so my attendance rate just dropped quite significantly and they um eventually took me and put me into Northern Health School, which was amazing. That was a really supportive environment, but um, to, it, it's not like a permanent kind of solution. Um, so I was kind of given the choice to go back to normal school um, or, uh, I mean, I could have done correspondence, but um, I decided instead to drop out and start looking at the workforce because school just didn't feel right for me at that time. Isn't it crazy? I mean, thank you for sharing that. Because I mean, isn't it crazy that um, there's a perception out there um, that if you drop out of school, that's it, you can't go to university, that's it, your life is all over. And I mean, we talk to lots of people where that doesn't happen. You know, there's the mainstream method of, you know, level one, level two, level three, go to university, tick the boxes. But, um, you know, you're an example of, hey, you don't have to go through that straight line way to get to where you want to go. So um, you dropped out of school and where did that adventure, because I'm guessing it's the start of the adventure for you. Um, I'm going to use the word adventure because it has been a bit of an adventure for you. Um, where did that take you? Um, well, for a while I was just doing, you know, work. I did a little bit of admin stuff and I worked at um, a supermarket for a bit. Um, and I realized that, especially with the anxiety that I had at the time, that that kind of work was way too much for me I, I was a 16 year old and um dealing with all of these uh mental troubles um so i ended up kind of looking into my passions and seeing what i could kind of do with them um i ended up talking to this amazing person uh who worked on a film set um and they talked about script writing and the opportunities that they found that i could bring and writing was always a thing that I had used to cope um, and just found a great passion in. And uh, I ended up finding about South Seas Film School. And um, yeah, I, I decided to apply to that. Um, and they, they don't have like these university entrance requirements um, and they were quite happy to take me on. And so, yeah, I, I jumped into film school um, and Oh boy, that was a whole journey in and of itself. Um, I ended up loving it. I realized that you could actually love learning environments. Um, <laughs> I think I, I thrived a lot there. Um, yeah, I uh, ended up walking away with a, a short film that I was quite proud of um, and a little degree um, as well. And that's actually uh, my high grades there is what actually led me to get university entrance um and that's how otago ended up accept accepting my uh, application yeah awesome i mean there's so much in there i'm going to dive into the first one i'm going to dive into is the person that you met the person that you met that was amazing what did they say or what did, how did they make you feel that that actually transfix you for you to try this journey here i guess transfix what a crazy word i mean I wanted to make you do this journey here. hey I, I don't even remember. They just, I, I just remember latching onto this idea of script writing. Um, they said that they had submitted something and um, it had got produced um, and they were excited. And I think I was just feeding off of their energy. Um, I got excited. I I'd recently actually done like a, a little course online um, where I got to write a script and 
I had done awfully, but I, I loved it. I thought it was so cool. Um, and yeah, they, they just ended up telling me about this magical place called Film School. Um, and I was transfixed. Um, yeah, I was like, whoa, hold on. There's actually like a potential career path for me that involves, you know, the things that I love and I don't actually need to have all the school stuff behind me. Um, film school, like it's a it's a really practical place. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I really just fed off of their excitement about it. <laughs> that's, that's so cool because I know, you know, lots of times people in your life that... Um it's not what they say or what they do is but the way they make you feel that just either get you to grow or not grow you know um and it's pretty awesome that's happened that's happened for you or that happened for you at that stage in your life but now you go you leave this environment where there was anxiety you know at school through through no fault of yours and into the shopping you know being working in a, in a supermarket again with anxiety there you're now in this film sc film school how did you how did that change for you did the anxiety stop or did it just get take taken away it can get taken away um just get so you're so engulfed with your work that you actually this is so amazing that you don't think too much about it yeah i mean anxiety is a weird one um i have suffered from pretty severe anxiety since probably intermediate even before then um i wouldn't say it took it away yeah. um i would say that it gave me a safe place to learn how to battle that. Um, film school is not a place where you can get away with not interacting with people. Yep. Um, we're constantly on film sets and I, um, in order to do script writing, you also have to do directing. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think that's a really interesting choice because that's a very, a very introvert and extroverted thing kind of crashing together, but it, it forced me to come out of my shell a bit. Um, I had to stand up for my ideas. Um, I, I was really passionate about um, the film that I wanted to uh, walk away with at, by the end of the year, our final project. And um, in order to make it happen, I had to lead people um, and communicate my ideas and express express my passion. Um, it It was really challenging for me um but i i think the passion kind of outweighed the fear um you know i made the choice to stand up and pitch that project um and i felt like after the support that i saw from my peers once i did that like that was the that was kind of the turning point um i realized that i do have kind of what it takes to to do this um it's just making that first really, really scary, but you know, first step. Yeah, and the step is the first step is always the scariest step. And then it's crazy because the next step is also a first step, but because you've got momentum, it becomes a little bit easier, just a little bit easier, not as hard as before. And um what I love is that, you know, when we first started this conversation, you spoke about the passion, but I love how you brought it back to you. actually it was still challenging. You know, it's very easy for us to go things that are amazing and all good, but actually it's still tough. Things are still tough. And it doesn't mean just because you enjoy something, it's going to be, life is going to be easy. It might be easier, but it's not going to be easy, um, which is which is a great reminder for us. And I guess this goes back to what um, Tanya was saying at the start. You know, you have all these plans here. I think things are going to be easy. And then, boom, things but but challenging, right, Tane? Yeah, for sure. And I think also, you know, sometimes your ambition changes as well. You know, not to the full extent of, oh, my goal has changed, but sometimes there's small things that actually change and give you a better outcome even though it's not the outcome you originally were seeking so I think that's also been a good thing for me to reflect on is that hey originally I wanted to you know go further with league or something like that but you know although I haven't been able to get to that end goal that I wanted I still got many things that I have taken away from me that I wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah awesome and I think that all that makes sense and it is quite important for everyone to hear that that these things will happen ambitions might change but doesn't change the goal um bob let's talk about your film they them was that was that the one that was that the one that you did at film school yes yes that was uh my big final project yeah um yeah, that i did at, at south seas 
um yeah what do you want to know about that i want to know what what is was it so um the reason i want to ask that question is because um is this was it a, a personal story or was it linked to what inspired the story i guess um oh yeah it, it was a deeply personal story yeah. um they them is about um you know a teenager that's battling with their gender identity um trying to find the confidence to say actually yeah this is this is who i am um you know they're dealing with the kind of things that i i dealt with during high school um the bullying the um misunderstandings and you know all of this uh, confusion i suppose that that comes with a you know it's an identity thing that's huge yeah. um so yeah they then was very much born out of the things that kept me up at night i would say um and i it, it's interesting i was tossing and turning um I, I wasn't sure if i should pitch that film or if i should pitch something that's much less personal um and i i remember angsting about it to my friend and they're like no you 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 have to do the thing um you know this is this is big and it's going to be important to people um and it's important to you um you know your other idea sounds cool but um it's not from the heart yeah so i'm just stoked i listened to that um cuz i i i wonder what would have happened if i let that fear kind of win out you know yeah and it's it's so, it's so crazy how fear does that right you know um your your if so, your life would be totally different different life path if if you had listened if you listened to yourself you know, right at the start, I was like, yeah, we are, we are our own worst enemies and our own worst judges, but it's awesome that you had friends who are like, ah, stuff that follow, follow your heart. I mean, the reason I, I, I talk about that is because um, your your movie has now, obviously, um, it's the way the world is going at the moment. And um, it's now become, at that point in time, let's go back to the time when you actually created it. Do you Did you think that, hey, the, the movement of the world would shift so much that your movie now becomes actually talked about in, in, in the world of YouTube and elsewhere as well? I, I continue to be shocked, I'll be honest. Um, when, I, when I pitched it um, to my class, there, there were some people there that were quite aggressively against it. Um, there were people that were... Um, protesting in a little way um not aggressively but it was it was definitely there um thankfully that kind of behavior wasn't tolerated um so that was nice but um i remember the day that um it was viewed for the first time uh, you know, on the big the, the big screen in front of the whole school um they got a standing ovation and i i like i'd spent the whole time the movie was playing sinking into my seat just in utter embarrassment i was like i mean this is such a personal story so i was like this is me spilling my guts to just a whole bunch of of people um whose whose you know opinions i i cared about pretty deeply um and the fact that the whole room stood to applaud the film like it was um it was crazy to me and i when I put it on YouTube, I thought maybe if I was lucky, it would reach one person that needed to see it. Um, but I we just broke three million views, <laughs> and um, that's absolutely insane to me. Uh, and I have received so many messages saying, "Wow, this has helped." Um, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Uh, there's like a lot of hate comments that I get, but overwhelmingly, it's not only been supportive, but it's been helpful, and it's really nice to yeah, see. It's, <laughs> it's really, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's really fantastic, especially because it's a it's a story born out of a personal personal journey, you know. So so all the comments that you're getting are people um, that are probably going through the same journey or resonating with them. Um, what you have gone through going through and will be going through i guess you know because humans are humans are nice but also humans are pretty evil and nasty pieces of work sometimes so um it's really awesome that you've got that there and um you know true appreciation for that there 
Um, I do have a question that's a bit random. I have watched a few of your um, video clips on YouTube. Tell me, why is it Hey Comrades? Tell me about the Hey Comrades. Um, <laughs> that's a rad, really rad, interesting... Rad, rad question, right? <laughs> See, when I first started saying that, I just thought it was a fun thing to say. Yeah, I was like, no one really <laughs> says Hey Comrades. Let's, you know, change it up a bit. And then everyone was like, I can't believe you're coming out here with this communist propaganda. And I'm like, wait, well, what? <laughs> um, yeah. I I don't know why, but I didn't connect the two. That wasn't a connection that happened in my brain until I started getting those comments. And I was like, ah, oh, actually, this reinforces it. Let's go. Oh, I love it. Comrades. I think, I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's really cool. And I, the reason why I, I like it, I think I like it, is because I grew up in Zimbabwe and everybody in Zimbabwe is a comrade everybody everybody you know so as soon as you become an adult everyone's a comrade and it's pretty crazy because it's not a communist country it's just yeah. things that have just come through and um it's so crazy how just by using a title people assume that you're linked to a certain political ideology which is which is crazy so i i love it now uh, guess i wanted to ask you about it because i think it's pretty awesome to put it out there and say hey this is just fun and games fun and games yeah well i mean and also like a big thing with it is it's gender neutral <laughs> Okay. Um, I was like, I could say guys, gals, and non-binary pals, but that's like a, it's a big mouthful. Comrades, nice and easy. <laughs> nice and easy, exactly, yeah, exactly. Very, very cool. So you finish up at film school, and why would you come to university now? You have this, you have this going here. What was the inspiration to go to university at that point in time? I, there was a few events that transpired after film school. Um. I I got some work on, on film sets um, and for the most part, it was kind of disheartening, I, I would say. Um, this is just my personal experience, but I, um, I found a lot of jobs that were, I, so as, as a trans person, um, I kind of use that as a, I was encouraged to use that as kind of a, a marketing thing. Um, you know, I, my tutors were like, look, people love those diversity points, put that out there and you'll get jobs. And you know what? It worked. It works. Um, I did a job on a queer set and <laughs> uh, I found out on the day of shooting, basically that, um, no one in the production team was any sort of queer, nor were they New Zealanders, despite it being a uh, Aotearoa-based um, queer story. Uh, and it it showed very heavily in um, in the themes, in the writing, um, in the direction um, that it was it was very much just some white rich people coming in from overseas and um yeah kind of taking the story from us is how it felt um and i was paid you know pennies um to do this project that um had been picked up by tvnz um that just felt exploitative of new zealand queer culture um and the film industry is is a tiring one to be in um it's quite often you know 16 hour days uh driving all over the place um it's it's really tough work especially if you're not at those kind of higher levels um and it very much feels like on a lot of productions people don't really care um and i I don't know it just kind of shocked me I guess and I think I, I've also worked on some amazing sets um I worked on Rurangi which um was produced pr like incredibly incredibly produced um it was it was well paid it was as if my work was valued 
Um, they took care of me. They got to know me despite having such a tiny role. I was on screen for like 10 seconds and um, there was just so much love that they gave me and it was awesome, you know, compared to these other roles where um, sometimes I was just paid um, in fuel vouchers uh, despite the fact that it was, you know, dancing with the stars. I got paid in fuel vouchers. Um, I very much believe that um, people should be paid enough to live. <laughs> totally. I mean, uh, that I mean, is... <laughs> fuel vouchers are not going to feed you, are they? It's a fuel voucher that's not going to feed you. And it's it's really... I'm, I'm really glad you bring it up because, you know, there's a there's a perception which is correctly and correctly out there that you know working in film is glamorous and amazing and that you will be looked after really well but as you pointed out like like any like any career pathway there's good and bad you know um and i love how you just balance it out by saying hey there was some amazing amazing opportunities for you but also there were times when you were just exploited you know physically and just say hey do the work um and it's any 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 career pathway but I guess was that your driver to go right? Cool, I want to change out of this, or was it you're like I'm tired of this? I want to go and do some study. I think, I think the big thing that I learned from that, um, it wasn't, man, I hate the film industry. Um, it was more, I I learned based on you know the sets that I liked and the the sets that I didn't like. What the thing that drove me most is. Um, this kind of want to help people, I suppose. Um, the film that I made as my final piece, They, Them, um, you know, I, that was, that came from a place of love. Um, and I want to share my story so that others wouldn't, you know, they, they could feel like there's someone else that's kind of gone through it. You know, it's a transferal of empathy, I suppose. Um, and in rewriting, like the same kind of thing, like I believe that that story could help people. Um, whereas some sets I felt like were actively unhelpful. <laughs> but I had always kind of, I'd always tossed up, you know, throughout my life, one of two kind of career paths. I either wanted to be a writer uh, or to be a psychologist. So, um, and actually, uh, once I finished film school, I had this idea for a story and it was very psychologically based. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, if only I knew more about psychology. <laughs> um, and, you know, all of this stuff about wanting to help people more, I realized that a, a really good opportunity for me would be to go to university um study psychology and uh attempt to become a clinical psychologist um because that would give me the opportunity to help people more directly um and you know when i was growing up and i needed psychology myself i never found anyone that could really understand the transgender experience um and that led to a lot of different troubles um with dysphoria and uh with accessing um testosterone and you know all that kind of thing um so I kind of wanted to fill in that gap and be that person that I wanted since I was a kid I suppose um and I figured that you know I could stick with writing I could um I but I think that would be a nice thing to have on the side. I think it's nice to combine the two, even. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of what inspired me to go to you. It's, it's so, it's so um, awesome that you share that because um, a lot of people we had on our podcast, a lot of people we speak to talk about um, something that's happened in their lives that inspires them to get to get to the path that they want to. You know, um, when I speak to young people, I'm like, why do you actually want to do what you want to do? Like, what is the what is the what is the why behind what you want to do? And sometimes it's about making money and you know those the superficial level, level stuff and then as you keep digging and you keep digging and you keep questioning and they go oh wait a minute i actually don't really want to make money it's because the world says i need to make money i mean yes you got to get paid but if you're going to choose something based on money you're going to make i, I don't 
found, this is all my own personal opinion, that you are not going to find happiness in that in that way with what you do. You might be successful. I mean, success is all cool, but you might not find that 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 hard thing. So it's really awesome that you you found you know you, you did your, your joy with this this the writing, and then you're motivated to do more to help other people as as a driver for you to go to to go to university. And I guess Tyler, you felt the same thing because you know you had all those crazy choices when you were. We always speak about this when you were in year thirteen. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's a it's a hard decision. Like for sure, it's definitely difficult and challenging. But you know, it's it's about sitting down and actually making that decision because at the time you're just so overwhelmed with all this information, and you know that this is the right step for you, and you're so bogged down on I need to make the right decision. Where sometimes it's nice to just sit back and actually just not worry about it and not stress about it. And sometimes that decision actually comes to you, you know, which is hard to be sitting there when you've got to apply for halls and apply for what you want to study and all these other things so it's one of those paradoxes where you know as much as you want to go 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 and actually just make the decision and then make it final sometimes you actually have to just step back and be like actually the decision will come to me I just need to figure out and have time to actually come to terms with what's going to be happening next and as humans you find it very hard to do Mm. (laughs) we find it very hard to do so, about you've you've made the choice to go to university. Now you have a choice. You um, you're living in Auckland, I guess, at, at this time, or were you back in Rotorua? Or... Yeah, no, I'm I moved back um to be with my parents at, after I finished from school. Yeah, so right, cool. So in Rotorua, and you now have a choice to go to um a university. And as you've spoken before, there's eight universities in this country. What made you choose to come to go as far away as possible from Rotorua? Well, part of it was the fact that it was the furthest away from, um, you know, where I grew up. Yeah. Um, but uh, a massive part of it was, you know, I came down to visit some friends that, that come here um, just during a holiday one time. And I had the opportunity to kind of just explore the campus casually. I wasn't really thinking about university at this point. Um I was just kind of visiting friends and, you know, having fun, but I, I went to a couple of the classes that they attended, um, and I immediately fell in love with the place. Um, the, the campus is beautiful. Um, it's stunning. And I think I was visiting in the spring, uh, either spring or autumn. And it's just, it's, it's beautiful during those times. Um, and not only that, but, um, you know, I, I visited my friend's uh, gender studies class and, oh my God, it was just so interesting. Um, and I was like, this is what education, like, you know, real education uh, can look like. I was kind of imagining, like, boring lectures, um, you know, some, like, half the class asleep. Um, you, I, I you didn't expect that lectures, it to be fun. Are you saying all your lectures are fun, though? Not all of my lectures are fun. <laughs> just, just checking. Yeah. Um, but um, they they tricked me. Um, they, they tricked you. They damn. tricked me with this one that I came and visited. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I I I I think I came. A big part of it was the lecturer that I saw, um, Fairly Gilmore, who is in the gender studies and criminology department. I think that they are incredible. Um, an incredible teacher. And I was like, yep, I want to come and I want to study in their classes, please. (laughs) Um, It, I, it wasn't a choice for me. I, I knew I had to come to Otago. Um, Yeah, it it was Otago a bust. There we go. And and then that's the the rest of history, I guess. So you've, you've come to Otago now and that's pretty cool. And what's, what's that been like for you, not just academically, but your, you as an as as Bo as your identity has that been has it been interesting or has it been what has it been like I guess um it's been great I I've always kind of valued my independence I suppose um and you know being so far away from family I think it's actually helped me thrive a little bit um I have my own space I have my community that I've kind of developed and formed um, around me. And I mean, it's, it's a challenging move. It, 
any move like this is is really scary um especially like i my social anxiety never went away <laughs> um yeah. i when i first got here i made th- friends at my hall not through exploring socially it was because um my subordinate approached me and kind of said you're trans right i i know some more trans people at the hall here i'll i'll push you in their direction <laughs> um and i was lucky enough that that actually worked out really really well for me um they were awesome people um uh, but i um yeah i i feel like i adapted pretty quickly to the environment um i made new friends i had my old friends who were around to support me and kind of guide me through everything um yeah no it um it felt fairly seamless to me um but i know it, it is a it is a tough one <laughs> it, is, it is it is challenging and, and i like i like how you said it is scary it's scary um and again some other person came in and influenced the way things worked out for you you know your sub warden came in and picked picked up the fact that hey well it might be a bit lonely here a bit quiet here let's try and find some common commonality and you know get people to meet other people and i think tony this is what you're trying to do as well right well i hope you try and do that i don't know yeah i definitely try and do it um there was one boy on my floor this year who started off quite quiet and you know didn't have a lot of friends that he knew down here um coming from wellington so you know he was moving quite a far away from home um but i think it was also trying to find that balance where i pushed other people as well to go and talk to him so it didn't feel like hey i'm singling you out and you need to go talk to people because otherwise i can't have you struggling it was more of a hey here's other people that you know i knew he played soccer at the time um so finding a few friends and just seeing what his interests were you know so finding a way where i could support him without pushing him to go and do things because that's not what the journey is about you know and often when you do push people to do things people don't want to do it so that's why it was more about hey here's other people you know just go and see what happens and that actually worked a lot better than you know pushing him to spend time with those people and to spend time with the floor and that's really cool. I'm going to go back to to Bo with this because Bo, you're a sub warden right now. How do you, what what approach do you use? Are you, are you similar to Tane, or do you have a different approach? Yeah, no, I I'm I'm pretty similar to Tane. Uh, if I see um, someone a little bit lonely, um, I might kind of I I like to investigate their interests a little bit, see who they m- might like to match up with, and if I can find someone that's pretty pretty comfortable socially i might give them a nudge and just be like oh why don't you invite you know so and so along um we also uh as a you know a circle of subordinates um we we kind of take note of people that might uh, be struggling a little bit with finding friends and we kind of find ways that we can um kind of put them together or we'll hold like a like a board game night or something for quieter people and um, just see if we can, yeah, f- formulate some friendships there. I, I quite like playing um, matchmaker myself. <laughs> um, uh, I think, well, I mean, it it helped me in my first year, um, and I developed some pretty awesome friendships out of that. So, I I feel like it's a it's a pretty tried and true method. And 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 that's good. I mean, you know, it's it's important. Um, I think it's important in both of the roles that you both have that um, building a community is not just about singing love, but also saying, hey, let's find a common common factor, but also creating an environment where those can blossom. Because too often we just go, hey, you and you are the similar, let's just become, become friends. It doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't work like that. And maybe sometimes it does, but it doesn't really work like that there. Um, and but what's it been like? So what was your motivation then to become a subwarden? So you do your first year and um, we all know subordinating is not it's 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 a thankless task. I mean, it's a th- I mean when I say thankless, I mean you don't do it for the financial incentive. Let's be honest. I mean there might be tiny, but it's just not that's not why you do it. What was your your motivation to go back and be and give back? I guess. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a few different reasons. Uh, I loved the hall that I stayed at. Um, that was a big one. Um, Caroline Freeman College is 
exactly the kind of place that um I needed to be. It felt like home. So I I love the place. I love the staff, and I wanted to uh, be part of that community a little bit longer, I suppose. Um, and additionally, it's it comes back to the helping people thing. Um, my sub warden helped me uh, when I initially arrived in finding friends, and I wanted to do something similar. I I wanted to um, I wanted to help make some first years. Uh, you know, first years away from home, like meaningful and, uh, you know, give them some good memories. Um, and I mean, on a more selfish note, I suppose it looks pretty good on your CV, uh, especially, uh, applying for clinical psychology, um, having those, it is a very, um, care-based job. Um, I don't know how it is with your work, Tane, but, um, at least at CFC, there's quite a lot of uh, pastoral care, um, mental health support, um, fostering of social relationships and that kind of thing. Um, it, yeah, so it's exactly kind of up my alley. Um, and CFC is also a very queer place. We um, we have a lot of trans students and I love that I can kind of be a, a mentor to them. Um, I don't know, I, I like to um I just I just kind of grab them and put them under my wing and I make sure nothing bad ever happens to them <laughs> yeah that's that's really awesome that's a fantastic motivator right there and um let's talk about your the your I don't like to use the word journey but it's the word that everyone uses your your journey um as you transition how has that been oh boy it is yeah I think journey probably is the, the right word um it's been a really long one. Um, I, I mean, if we wanted to start from the start, I think I knew that I was trans from a very young age. I remember um, spending one summer at, at a camp. I managed to convince everyone that I was a boy called Sean and uh I wore girls' clothes because my mum wanted a girl, uh, but I wasn't one. Um, and I was quite successful in convincing everyone that that was the case. I like to think, at least. Um, yeah, we'll go with that there. <laughs> I also, um, I started a, a No Girls Allowed Superhero Club, um, and I would play with my little action figures in my dollhouse, um, I feel like all the signs were there. I don't really know why anyone was surprised. <laughs> um, but um, I ended up actually coming out around the time I was 15. Um, I wanted to use Bo as my name. It wasn't my given name at birth. Um, but I thought that it would be a nice name because it sounds a lot like my last name. And if I didn't want to come out to people, I could just say, ah, it's, it's a nickname, you know, that's why I use it. Um, but I, I've wanted to be on testosterone, um, uh, since I was like 13 or 14. Um, I only got onto it when I was 20. Um, and that, that was a really tough journey just because the mental health system, th there isn't a whole lot of people that are trans um, in the mental health system and, or even really know the trans experience. You So in order to start testosterone, you need permission from a counselor. You need to kind of state your case and prove yourself as trans. Um, and they get to determine if you're, mentally well enough to go on it I suppose um and making an informed choice um the first psychologist that I saw uh turned me down it kind of a funny story I feel um they they were my psychologist for a little while um they were helping me through coping with my OCD and they actually had just said okay this this will probably be our last session I feel like you don't need me anymore uh, you're doing really well. And then I was like, okay, 
can I go on testosterone? And she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't think you're <laughs> mentally in a space where you could be doing that right now. I was like, what? Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Um, you just said I was. This is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the second person that I saw, they said yes, but um, I read their referral letter and it was dead name thinks that she is a boy and would like to go on testosterone, please. And I was like, that's yeah um so like i said uh there's not a whole lot of people that really understand the transgender experience and the mental health system um and it leads to a lot of dysphoria and it leads to um a lot of um you know pauses in the process um it does take quite a lot of time to even see a mental health professional um so it, it's been a tough one. It uh, I've been trying to get on since I was about 16 or 17. It took me until I was 20 to get my first dose of tea. Um, and there was COVID, and that was, was COVID, you're right? That was, there was, that was there COVID. Was... Yes, yes, it was at the end. It was at the end of the lockdown. Okay. I got All my right. first dose. Okay, cool. Um, oh, boy, what a year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I I had also been convinced not to start it um, for a little while. Um, people were telling me that it brought about anger issues and all that. So I was like, whoa, maybe I shouldn't. Um, but I'm I'm really thankful I did. So yeah, that that's that's kind of oh, brilliant my journey. And and that was that's oh, two years ago. And how has it been since then? You know, so like we said, the start has been really, really challenging. And has it been just as challenging now that you start the process or is it or they is it easier? medically medically it's been challenging yeah. um i i've loved it i have loved all of the little changes uh that it's brought even i i get excited even when my voice breaks i'm like oh <laughs> um it's it's an in, imperfect kind of process it's it's puberty number two um yeah. which is a tough one to go through um as a a leader within you know my job and like being a student at university it's um it is it is a bit strange um medically it's been a bit of a mission um just because again even the health system it's it's not designed for trans people um it's been two years and I still have not uh, had an increase in my dose. Um, so I'm, I'm currently on the lowest dose that you can be. Um, and by now I should, I, I should be well and truly past that. Um, but I have just recently, I think within the past week, I just got a letter from the breast clinic saying that I have an appointment for my top surgery um so that's exciting i'm quite happy with that uh but it is it's been a long process and it will be a long process i'll probably still be um in the transitioning phase within like the next three years but it, it's okay it's a journey it's a journey and i guess you've got traction now which is great you know um slow traction but traction is better than no traction right um which is which sure. really cool. but i i um you you raised a really interesting point there because you know um you're both leaders in your communities, but you also have your own battles in your own lives that you're leading. How how does how do you I'm gonna to go to Bo first and I'll come to you Tony. How do you how do you manage that there? Because um like you said before, you like to take the take these young under your wing and make sure nothing happens to them, you know, because you're there for them. But at the same time you are going through your own battles. How does that how does that come across? I mean for you as a person. Oh. But yeah it's it's a tough one it's remembering myself has been probably one of the greatest challenges that i've come across in the past two years as a sub warden um i started out giving absolutely everything i had and i soon learned that you you cannot pour from an empty cup um 
yeah, it, it, I definitely, I learned very quickly that I have to take care of myself in order to be able to take care of others. Um, it's, but it, it's, it's a really tough one. Um, you know, uh, continuing to be your own person as, especially as like a, a representative of a community um, and as a face, um, as subwardens, especially, Tana, do you live in? Uh, yep, yep. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we are present all of the time. Um, and, you know, just going to meals, even on our days off, you have to put on a, a happy face. Um, pretend that we're composed at all times, even if we're, you know, suffering a crisis, we, we have to look um, like we've got everything together because... I mean, no one really wants to look up to um, their mentors and just see someone absolutely crumbling to pieces. Um, and, you, you know, I've never really been crumbling to pieces, but, you know, there are tough days. Um, and uh, it is, it's a really interesting dynamic being, being the face and, yeah, trying to present as someone to aspire to be. Um, yeah. I find it really interesting. I'm sure Tana has some great thoughts on this too. Yeah, I, th I, I agree with what Bo says. And I think the hardest part is how do you differentiate your own life from um, the life as a subwarden and especially being a live-in. Um, you know, when you wake up and you want to go, you know, you want to go get ready for the day, you're still on the floor with the students. So, you know, you don't even really get that time in the morning to yourself to be able to just impose yourself and get ready for the day and then you know when you come back from all your studies and all your other commitments you come back and um you know as you say when you go to meal times it's you know okay i've got to be composed i've got to be seen as happy you know and that is probably the hardest challenge i've faced this year um but i think also one of the greatest strengths has been finding my other passions and so getting back into sport that's really helped me to actually get a few hours away from the hall um it's definitely a big commitment and I like to compare it to like a high school teacher or a primary school teacher where you know if you see those teachers outside of the classroom setting they still say hello they still you know we'll have a conversation with you it's not like the job is stopped and it's much the same as us as subordinates you know when you go on campus and you see a resident you still say hello you still, still see how they're doing which does take a toll as the year goes on but I think it's one of the things where you, you find your own um, kind of balance between how much you put towards being a subordinate and how much you put towards your own studies. But you're right, it's it's an imperfect balance that you are constantly changing and managing week by week, day by day. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, when I was a subordinate, I found that really, really challenging and I found it really, really tough. But, and I guess for me, it was a little bit different because the world of social media didn't really, it wasn't exploding when mm. I was a subordinate. And I guess that's another phase for, for the two of you because now do you accept their friendships on social media or do they, it's, it's such a whole different, it's not just about, like I said, it's not just about seeing you on campus, it's about seeing you anywhere, mm. you know, seeing what you're doing anywhere in your life. And, um, you know, that's a whole other conversation we can have. But I just remember in my time, we just had the strict rule that, hey, that, that's when Facebook, I'm not don't give away my age here, but Facebook had just started started then, and um, you know there was a clear definition in our rules that you couldn't be you couldn't friend request you couldn't friend request students, and that was quite easy at that time. But now, how many social media platforms are there? Mm -hmm. And you know you're also both on live your lives, you both on to post your content, and you have no idea who's going to find you and follow you, and that's 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 a tough one. So I envy I don't envy you both, but I also salute you both because I know that you both do fantastic roles. I mean I've heard from a lot of people. From your from your particular college as well, also you are so um, yeah, well done to both of you um, and and mutual respect as well, um, and now you have all this going on, bro, all the stuff going on here, and also you have your study. Let's talk about your study as well. Um, how how so you are you almost done with your study or how's or well your your first stage of your study, I guess. <laughs> yeah, last semester of um undergrad uh. But diving straight into into post grad next year, so yay! <laughs> Here we <laughs> come. Exactly, awesome. And I guess you know, Tana, you're in the same phase as well. You're this is your last semester of undergrad as well. And I guess for both of you, this is now an academic transition that's going to be very very different because post grad is a whole different ball game altogether. But it's also exciting. 
hopefully yeah very very exciting it's that it's going to be different right like it's it's a whole different concept and i think that's what has been interesting this year coming into for me being my first year as a sub warden as well you know looking at these first years who are just trans transitioning into university and for me it's much the same as i go into postgrad because it's going to be completely different to what i've just experienced for the last three years so you know as we've done tours for year 13s to come through the colleges and you know see their next step in their journey on much the same in terms of you know being nervous about what's going to happen next year who I'm going to be with next year who's still going to be down here because you know most people are going to be graduating and moving on so it's going to be completely different next year but as much as it is scary it's also very exciting yeah well do you have the same sentiments or is your you feeling a bit different uh, yeah no it yeah we're it's interesting like university is just a bunch of a collection of transitions i suppose um i yeah yeah it is it is a scary kind of moment in time for me i'm nervously awaiting to hear whether i get into the program that i want to and yeah, yeah um and every year of this postgrad kind of program that i'll be doing um will be different if i if i do get in um you know you go honors then you have a clinical year and um it's just constantly changing so um i think i've learned recently to to be quite adaptive um yeah you know what i, I love what you just said there is university is just a series of transitions what a great way to describe university you know, first year is different to second year, second year is different to third year, and if you keep on going, every stage is a transition. I'm going to use that. Thanks, Bob. It's very, very cool. Um, we have been talking for almost oh, just over an hour now, um, which is really cool. Like I said at the start, the time just time just flies. Um, and Bob, you know, we can talk about so much, so many more things in your world, um, but we might have to get you back on here at another point and have another another topic. But I want to, before we round off, I just want to ask you. Um, for our listeners out there who want to maybe watch or view your movie, where can they do that? Is it easy for them to access? Yeah, um, just search they slash them uh, Bo Bofal. It should it should come up. Um, yeah, uh, just put it put in my name on on YouTube, and it should be fairly easy to find. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Check it out for our listeners. Check it out because why not? I mean. Yeah, check it out. There's nothing to lose. Always, always something to learn when you watch something. You you don't have to agree with things. You don't have to disagree with things. It's just something you can enjoy, and that's that's great. Um, yeah. Now I'm going to ask you the hardest question that we always have with our guests. Um, well, they think it's the hardest. You might just find this easy. Our podcast is called Bastards of Knowledge, and you've shared tons and tons of experiences today with with um with with your journey so far. If you were going to share one piece of knowledge for people to bring to their basket, what would you share as a bow, as a bow piece of wisdom? As a bow piece of wisdom. Yeah. Um, oh, that is such a difficult question. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I, I think something that I've learned um, as a sub warden and as someone that uh, is in that, that does a lot of care um something that i've learned quite recently um that is really important is uh you can you can bring a horse to water but you can't force it to drink um you can pour all of your effort into someone and they have to be the ones to kind of accept that um and not only that but you have to trust in the people that you're caring for that uh, when they say that they're okay, um, it will drain you so much if you don't believe them. Um, sometimes you just need to believe that things will be okay um, and let them come to you if they need it. Um, otherwise, you're going to burn yourself out and that's not going to be helpful for them or for you uh, or for anyone else that you need to support. Um, it was kind of a... <laughs> Have had that was a bad description of what I'm thinking, but um, yeah, I, I, that's I kind of what I, I. I like it because I think I think what you're trying to say is you know sometimes you can only do what you can do, 
and some other people have to take ownership as well and you know given the roles that you have but also in life you know if you're the kind of person that is an empath and you see someone that is struggling and at some point you've got to go right cool if you say you're okay i'm just gonna stop because i can't keep digging um because like you said you know if you mentioned this you know um burnout becomes real you can't you can't give them an empty cup you know that's what happens when you start worrying about that um yeah, so that's that is a good learning for, for I think for any aspect in life, you know. So thank you for sharing that. Tony, any last words from you? No, I, I think I think Bo's shared everything that could be covered in this podcast. So yeah. Thank yeah. you, Bo. Yeah, thank you, Bo. Um, thank you so much for being on today. Hopefully you enjoyed enjoyed this. I'm I learned a lot. Um I'm almost a fan of your work and I'm I'm really lucky to have known you over the last few years. And we look forward to hearing some good news when um you hear about your post show program with cross fingers yeah, fingers you. crossed yeah fingers <laughs> crossed fingers eyes everything crossed um so this is out there thank you so much for listening to another podcast um this podcast would be nowhere without you so once again please feel free to share comment like on whatever platform you use um and as always before we start our next podcast uh make sure you find some way to fill your basket with some piece of knowledge thank you everybody bye <laughs>